Hello, my name is Dr. Sidney Freeman, and I am the founder and executive director of the Liberation Movement. And I'm so glad to present Saturday Soul, which is a program that's here to inspire and empower the Black community. We hope that it has the type of impact that is life-changing and affirming and helps you to change not only your family, but our community at large. I first wanna start out by thanking uh, Kirk Nugent and the composition team for facilitating uh, our audiovisual needs. And I wanna give those that are, are watching, whether on YouTube or on Facebook, the opportunity to just say where they're from. I'm, I'm looking uh, where they're watching from. So I'm watching the chat here. Uh, thank you, Sister Brenda uh, Turner for being here. Uh, uh, please just uh, share the link. If you're on, please share the, the link from YouTube or Facebook. Encourage your family and your friends to watch. This program is going to be so powerful dealing with this concept of combating white pathology. So I am so thankful and grateful that you are here with, with us. So I'm going to share a little bit about our guest on today. Dr. Jerome Crichton, uh, Crichton's professional experiences reflect a synergy of theology, organizational psychology, clinical psychology, cultural diversity, and counseling. As a professor at Diablo Valley College, he teaches courses in African-American psychology and race and ethnicity, engaging the challenges of organizational diversity and others. And since 2004, he has worked as a consultant conducting seminars, workshops, and teaching in leadership, diversity, and conflict management. Some of his uh, primary clients have included California State University East Bay, Rainbow Community Praise Center International in Fontana, California, and the British Union of Seventh-day Adventists and others. And so without further ado, let's bring on Dr. Crichton. How are you doing today, Dr. Crichton? I'm doing great, thank you, Dr. Freeman. Uh, pleasure to be here with you today. Wonderful, wonderful. I also, I just see uh, a name here, uh, Torrance uh, Critch, uh, Crutchfield. Uh, welcome uh, being here. Thank you so much for being here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Crichton, to just introduce this concept of white pathology and how uh, we can uh, know what it is, but then also figure out ways in which to address it in our lives. All right. So um, let me begin by sharing a little background on uh, how I uh, came to this subject. Um, so I've, I've entitled this presentation, White Pathology Mitigation. White Pathology Mitigation, Understanding and responding. So um, it began when uh, I started teaching a course at Alliance International University, uh, which is located in Emeryville, just moved from San Francisco to Emeryville. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, it, it began when I was teaching, uh, preparing to teach that course um, African American psychology, um, you know, is very involved. Essentially, it's um, dealing with the behaviors of uh, African American people relative to the field of psychology. You can advance the next slide. Um, so, the challenge that I had was to be able to research and understand the um, behaviors of African-Americans and black people in general uh, sufficient to teach the course effectively. I taught it one semester and after I got through this semester did a, a review, did some reflection 
and uh, discovered that um, there are a lot of ways in which I could improve teaching the course significantly. Um, at the at the crux of the issue, though, was understanding that the behavior of black people is largely a response or a reaction to white people. That's the nature of being in uh, an oppressed environment, you know, and having suffered oppression for multiple generations. So I had to then begin to take a look at why white people behave the way they behave in order to teach um, African-American psychology, black psychology. I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, so interestingly enough, courses that I taught at the undergraduate level at um, uh, uh, Diablo Valley College really helped me a lot in preparing to teach the graduate courses at Alliance International University, two of which I teach are African-American psychology and intercultural awareness development. And so the courses that I taught at the undergraduate level, um, introduction to psych, the psych 101, psychology and modern life, um, uh, biopsychology, social psychology, lifespan development, critical thinking in psychology, you know, came right on time. Um, I began teaching at Diablo College, Diablo Valley College in 2017. And I, I, I was, I was been teaching at Alliant International University since 2009. So um, it came along in a very timely way to help to give me uh, the data, the information, um, you know, things that I could use to teach this course. And then prior to that, of course, I had uh, completed studies in religion and theology going to Oakwood University, where I got a BA in theology with um, minors in biblical languages and history. I went to the theological seminary at Andrews University and did an MDiv and uh, did a Doctor of Ministry degree at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. These these things all equipped me to come to this subject, and we can go on to the next slide because they each of them deals with human behavior. Uh, we skipped one, so we need to go back. Um, I'm sorry, my mistake. Let's go forward. All right, so um, I'm going to come to talk about. Um, the various views of human behavior. But before I do, we need to just define a few terms. So for the purposes of um, uh, making this information accessible, you know, even when I teach my uh, classes to graduate and undergraduate students, I use the definition for psychology of why people behave the way they behave. Most people think that psychology is really focused in on you know, uh, on the cognitive aspects, but it's it's not, you know, not today at least. So an easy way of thinking of psychology is thinking in terms of why people behave the way they behave. White pathology um, can be defined as um, the attitudes and behavioral expressions of white people as a consequence of generations of socialization in psychiatry and clinical psychology, a pathology is characterized by adaptive inflexibility, vicious cycles of maladaptive behavior, and emotional instability under stress. You've seen a lot of that in the recent days in our national politics, right? Hypervigilance can be defined as a behavior involving a heightened state of alertness resulting from keen sensitivity to one's surroundings as a consequence of trauma or as an adaptation to a social environment. So, uh, and we can move on. So, you know, um, understanding these terms is very helpful because when we talk about a pathology, we're essentially talking about a disease model but what we need to understand in the context of white pathology, we're really talking about uh, a disease model where the catalyst is more social, right? Um, you know, not so much within the medical realm 
more so social, and I'm gonna to come to that a bit more. But here are the disciplines that, uh, some of the disciplines that deal with human behavior from which I have drawn my research and continue to draw my research. I am working on a book entitled White Pathology and Racial Habilitation. And so, um, you know, these are the areas that I have looked to. Anthropology studies the human experience biologically, culturally, linguistically, and archeologically. Psychiatry is the medical approach to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of psychological disorders. Psychology studies human behavior from the biological, psychological, that's the cognitive, social, and for our purposes, the spiritual perspective. And that's what I meant when I said that, you know, people think that psychology is about studying the cognitive more so, but um, really now uh, what's studied in psychology is the biopsychosocial model to which we will return. And I've added the spiritual on the basis of my uh, own education. And then theology, which can be variously defined, but it is defined for our purposes as the study of God or Yahweh, if you prefer, in, the, in relationship to the material and metaphysical realm, especially with reference to the human experience. So of course the metaphysical realm deals with that which is not material, right? Not physical, right? Um, and then, so each of these disciplines is heavily influenced by a Eurocentric worldview. And very little analysis of the attitudes and behaviors of white people, given their history, exists. So it's important up front to say that when we look at the literature, there is very little that examines or analyzes the behavior of white people as a whole, as a group. And um, it's interesting that, you know, though each of these disciplines study in some measure human behavior, there's no real comprehensive analysis of white behavior. Again, you know, I'm coming particularly from psychology, why white people behave the way that they behave. So this is what I'm addressing today, uh, along with addressing uh, our response to that. So um, let's go to the next slide. All right, so um, so white pathology should be under, understood in the same way that uh, any pathology is understood, you know, from the perspective of a disease model, how be it the emphasis is on the social aspect. So white pathology refers to the attitudes and behavioral expressions of white people as a consequence of generations of socialization. In other words, white people have been taught to act and to think, and they've gotten their behaviors as a result of generations of socialization. So the way they see, and I'm speaking particularly, particularly with reference to black people, so this does apply to, to other people who are, um, who are not black, other non-white people, but I'm speaking with specific reference to black people. When over multiple generations, white people have been taught to see black people as inferior, as animals, or as less than animals, this has helped to formulate uh, what we have today, right? Uh, in, psychi in psychiatry and clinical psychology, a, a pathology, as we've said, is characterized by adaptive, adaptive inflexibility, right? Vicious cycles of maladaptive behavior, emotional instability, et cetera, et cetera. All of these behaviors we see playing out with uh, reference to how white people in general relate to black people. It's important to state that um, it's not a question of whether white people are intentionally or unintentionally racist. Certainly those are things that we have to consider the point that, is, that I need to underscore here is that no matter how liberal they may appear to be or how liberal they may be or how conservative they may appear to be or how conservative they may be, how racist or non-racist they may be, it is, it is scarcely thinkable that any of them have escaped the socialization that is common to living in an oppressive society. So what I'm saying in essence is that virtually, 
and I underscore virtually all white people have been impacted by white pathology. And certainly there are some black people that have been impacted by white pathology also. We see certainly evidences of that in the highest court in the land and in certain, uh, previously in certain offices uh, in the land and we see them all around us. Um, Hypervigilance is um, basically the response of black people to white people that seeks to protect white people from perceived anxiety or fear or stress, right? So I, I as a black person, think that my interaction with a white person is going to cause some degree of stress or anxiety or fear. So then I change my behavior to try to ameliorate or to uh, resolve any tension that I perceive might be created. That, that's essentially what we mean by hypervigilance. So in other words, it's become a part of our behavior as black people to adapt our behavior in our interactions with white people to prevent them from what we perceive may be anxiety. And that's what we mean by hypervigilance. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Hypervigilance uh, really exists on a spectrum, right? And we can move to the next slide. Hypervigilance exists on a spectrum. Uh, next one, because we went backwards, uh, and 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 this this spectrum of uh, hypervigilance is something that you will recognize. We're going to get to it in just a moment, but let me just uh, mention um, that, uh, like in most of the sciences, what I'm taking is a theoretical approach that's based on data, right? So uh, because we are looking at white pathology as, um, you know, as a disorder, as a disease, we have to look at it from the perspective of a disease model, which is why this slide says a theoretical approach to etiology, to the etiology of white behavior. So etiology is the branch of medical and psychological science concerned with the systematic study of the causes of physical and mental disorders and the progress of a disease or disorder. As such, it must be studied from the perspective of origins, catalysts, and factors that perpetuate it. So this is certainly true of white pathology. We wanna go back and find out what the origin of white pathology is. Why is it that white people behave the way they behave? In a nutshell, I wanna tell you, and we're gonna you know, get into the details um, a, a little further on, there is an aphorism in counseling psychology, and it says that hurt people hurt people. That means that there is a tendency for people who have been abused to abuse others, right? We're not saying that everybody who is abused will abuse others. There is a tendency. When we look at the data, the data strongly suggests that most individuals who, uh, have, who have been guilty of abuse report that they were the victims of abuse. So this is what we mean. So this aphorism, hurt people, hurt people, is an aphorism that I've applied in looking at, at white pathology. That is to say that if we look back into the history of, of white people, of European, uh, European people, we see that there is a lot of trauma that has contributed to their behaviors and attitudes and dispositions, right? Um, just to cut to the chase, because our time is very limited, many of us as black people have often said in private, probably, that white folk are more concerned about their cats and dogs than they are about black people, right? They see a cat or a dog hung in a tree. There's more out outcry, you know, over the cat or the dog than there is over a black folk, a black person that got lynched, right? And I'm not, I'm not, trying to determine whether that is actually true or not. I'm simply saying that we have said that, that is the impression that we have based on our um, experience of, of relating with white folk. There tends to be this lack of, um, lack of affect when it comes to us and it 
has to do with how we feel that they perceive us. So when we talk about this aphorism, hurt people hurt people, it helps to give us a clue in this theoretical model about why, why white people behave the way that they behave. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, can we enlarge that just a bit? Uh, if not, it's okay. All right, thank you. So the theoretical approach to the ideology of white pathology is predicated on the historical and anthropological work of Sheanta Diop, who wrote The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. He also wrote Pre-Colonial Black Africa, and he wrote Civilization or Barbarism, right? So when we look at his work, you know, he uh, postulates the notion of the two cradle theory and, uh, you know, this idea that, um, you know, life began in Africa. There was a migration of um, people uh, out of Africa um, into the northern climate, which was cold and hostile, and that this contributed to their demeanor and disposition, right? It won't take time to go into all of that. But, um, you know, the theoretical approach is based on that. It's based on the work of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing in her book uh, entitled um, The Cress Theory of Color, Confrontation and Racism, um, which was influenced by Dr. Neely Fuller, who wrote a, compensa uh, a compensatory racist codified word guide, you know, in which um, the theory is put forward that because of the fear of genetic annihilation, there is a certain in inbred hostility that um that white people have toward black people um and um you know uh much of their behavior uh dr francis cress welsing uses um um you know um uh, part of the psychoanalytic approach in um looking at the behaviors of of white people and the symbolisms that they use um, in order to uh, make sense of their behaviors and, and attitudes, right? Uh, so those are, uh, that is a psychological theoretical approach, which is not taught within mainstream psychology. Everybody else can have their theoretical approaches, but, uh, you know, apparently black folk can't, right? And then there is the work of Dr. James a cone, one, um, and I just mentioned the book Risks of Faith and also The Cross and the Lynching, Lynching Tree. Uh, there is the work of Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, The Falsification of African Consciousness and General Readings in the Behavioral Sciences that helped to formulate this theoretical approach that, um, that I'm sharing with you. We can go to the next slide. So uh, we can go to the next slide if you advance it for me. So I've developed what I call the Crichton model of white pathology. And what it does is it looks at the, the elements that have uh, contributed to why white people behave the way that they behave. So if we go to the, to the, to the left, you can see under the etiology, right, the disease model, which talks about how how these behaviors and attitudes originated, there is, you know, again, the northern migration out of a warm climate into a cold climate. There is the, what we call the, um, the, the adaptions over time, which, which um, have to do with the physiognomy, the hair, the skin, right? Um, part of that uh, theory ha holds that, these were albino populations that migrated out of Africa. They were pushed out because they were seen as, um, you know, um, being evil, you know, or uh, bringing bad omens into the melanated population. Um, along with that, right, the climatic conditions which contributed to, you know, the, the micro evolutionary changes that we see in how they look, how they appear. There was a lot of uh, tribal warfare. Um, you know, if you studied anything about the, um, the tribes within Europe and the infighting, there was a tremendous amount of disease which involves going as far as the bubonic plague and other types of diseases that, that wiped out, you know, huge uh, population centers. Again, all of these, when we talk about etiology, 
have to do with trauma that were inflicted on them as a people. There's the persecution that was seen in the the move out of Europe into the new world, right? Um, there was a lot of religious persecution uh, in that time. If you've ever studied anything about the the history of um, the church, you know, the persecution of the Romans against the Protestants and so on, right? And then there is the factor of intermarriage, right? A great deal of intermarriage within, uh, you know, these European streams and certainly the the exile of European peoples from um, their, their, uh, their homelands, right? So all of these have contributed to the etiology, to the disease model, to the, you know, the, uh, they have created the impact of trauma, which is responsible for the attitudes and dispositions that we see even today. So we move next to the middle of the screen where you have the psychopathological symptoms that deals with, um, you know, more so the cognitive aspects, um, you know, how they think, why they think the way they think and the impact of that. So we see when we trace their history that there's a great deal of distortion of history you know, attributing, for example, civilization to the Greeks. We can go on and on and on, the theft of inventions. And, you know, uh, many of you all know the history, but for the sake of time, I'll move on. The disfiguring of artifacts like the sphinxes in Egypt, you know, um, lies as truth, right? Um, which is essentially substituting, substituting an example of that would be the white Jesus that is so popular you know, that has been so dominant within the world, right? Um, and then there is uh, the degrading and the othering. So this is seen in what we call the, the chain of being, right? With all of the uh, philosophies that came out of the Enlightenment period, the 17, 1800s, where, you know, uh, the white man was at the top of the pyramid and the black man was at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, right? before you get into the whole animal thing. So that's the degrading and the othering, right? And then we see uh, later on fear and distress. We see fear and distress today, which is, you know, the sort of outcry that you have now, the, the backlash against critical race theory and all of the other things that we see. And then you have narrative creation. You've seen this right in front of your eyes where there are new narratives about January 6th at the Capitol, right? New narratives, well, not so new narratives around when you see a video and you know what you see and they are telling you, well, you're not actually seeing what you're seeing because this is what's actually happening. Th this is um, really a, a sort of uh, evidence of cognitive desperation that we see where a group of people feel so threatened that in the face of truth, they will lie about the truth. And th these are all parts of the psychopathological symptom. And then we have the sociopathological symptoms, which is below that. And, you know, in that we, we see mass genocide, you know, the idea that in, um, in the, um, you know, 1400s, 1500s, or about 1200, um, I'm sorry, 12, 100 and, 112 million Native Americans, you know, uh, you get to 1863, 95% of the population has been wiped out, right? That's mass genocide. We have enslavement. You all know about the triangle trade, the Af you know, uh, African chattel slave slavery, land theft all throughout the world, right? Resource theft all throughout the world. We call that colonialism, the exploitation of nature, right? We see that even now. Um, manipulation in general, shallow emotions that again is the lack of affect when it comes to uh, other people and you know, the lack of empathy, the lack of sympathy, right? Um, this um, need for stimul stimulation, which is, uh, when I say need for stimulation, that is in, al in almost every sensory categorization, whether it be money or sex, right? Then there is this grandiose, sense of self, which is, which arrives out of um, an inferiority complex, right? Um, 
again, these are generalizations to give you an idea of how sociopathological symptoms work. Then there's what we call pathological individualism, which is evidenced in this idea that, um, you know, in this environment of, co of COVID, there are individuals who would prefer to exercise their rights than to exercise common sense and safety. That's pathological individualism, where your rights as an individual are preeminent above the needs of the larger community. And then there is this notion of shame and guilt, right? Which is why there is this resistance to critical race theory, you know, because they are ashamed of what they did. They feel a sense of guilt and do not want to relive it, can't face it, so they would rather deny it or squash it. And then there is this lack of remorse, this brazenness about having no sorrow for you know the things that were done in the past. Well, all these manifestations from the uh, etiology to the psychopathological symptoms to the sociopathological symptoms, um, in my view, are the consequence of the fact that hurt people hurt people. Right. Let's move on to the next slide. So let me just run quickly through the elements of white pathology be before I wrap up with, um, you know, um, our response to it. Right. So here are some of the elements of white pathology. There's cognitive dissonance. Right. When you have two thoughts or two ideas that are in tension with each other and these are uh, produce guilt and shame. There is this notion of color blindness. You know, I don't see color. Right. Which is the idea that uh, somebody is living in extreme denial because of the cognitive dissonance. There is collective forgetfulness. This idea that um, there is not a collective memory about the atrocities done through the slave trade where you have, you know, 25 percent of U.S. presidents that were a part of a rape culture. Right. Even though they, you know, um, Americans would like to celebrate them as great men. They were part of a rape culture, you know, and this um, the loss of memory, the convenient loss of memory, I might add, about all that was involved in terms of the breeding of human beings, the branding of human beings, the killing of children. And we could go on. Then there's uh, biological rationality. Right. This this idea that uh, you can somehow rationalize um, uh, the white pathology through biological arguments uh, such as um, um, eugenics. Right. And other types of uh, pseudoscientific uh, approaches. Then there's militarism. Right. This is, um, you know, seen in. Uh, in these militia types and uh, certainly in on the national level, always ready to go to war, right? Then there is this assumed superiority. Again, we mentioned that that comes out of an inferiority complex. We continually see defense mechanisms such as denial, deflection, projection, avoidance, right? And then plaus plausible deniability, right? Why should I be respond you know why should i be held accountable my generation didn't do this we were we're not the ones that enslaved anybody right plausible deniability then we have even though they're benefiting from whatever took place in the past then we have conscious and unconscious passive aggressive attitudes and behaviors and i want to pause here to say this that there are many good decent well-meaning white people so please don't get it twisted but that does not mean that they have escaped the socialization that is responsible for white pathology. I need to really, really be clear about that. I have white friends and I understand that they did not choose to be born when they were born. They did not choose where they would be born, the environment in which they would be born, and neither did we. So we really need to sort of broaden our horizons and our understanding about white pathology and not see it as a, a license or a means of attacking white people, but as an opportunity to understand why and how these behaviors exist and how we should best relate to them. So even the best and most well-intended white person in general terms is going to exhibit elements of white pathology because they could not avoid the socialization that they are a part of. Let's go to the next slide. 
So manifest destiny in American exceptionalism and religious worldviews. These are the way that white people have generally been socialized to see life. So that when you begin to bring up questions like in a religious context, like in, in Adventism, my religious context, about why eschatology, end time things are only from one perspective, you know, um, certainly it becomes troubling for the establishment, but it's a reasonable question. If white folk have done the theology, then they're going to have a worldview that reflects the manifest destiny and American exceptionalism and their religious worldview, right? It's not that my question is out of order. It's that nobody has ever raised the question as to, well, aren't there other ways of seeing this? Aren't there other ways of understanding the word? Aren't there other ways of knowing and being and doing? Right. So that's the issue with that. Then there's capitalism, exploitation and control, which unfortunately many of our people have fallen into and think that that is the standard for how we should exist and how we should survive and how we should be in this world. But when you take a good look at it, you know, it is so rife with uh, pathological individualism and we have a much better or stronger or healthful worldview that is you know, collectivistic in nature rather than individualistic. Then there are the existential motivations. Again, fear, security, ambiguity, survival control. These are what you see operating every day within your white colleagues and peers and friends, right? These, ex these existential motivations. They're afraid, they want security. They are concerned about ambiguity when you raise certain types of questions that challenge the status quo. They're interested in survival because if you pay attention to what Dr. Francis Cress Welsing has said, they're a diminishing population and there is no return because of the recessive uh, genes, right? Okay, so that has to be taken seriously. Um, number 10, there are these implicit attitudes, right? Which many of white people have not really thought out critically and they don't know that they are socialized to see you as subhuman or to see you as inferior, right? And this goes into, you know, deracination, colorblindness, colorism, um, you know, um, racializing, you know, all, all of these things. The, these things happen because we live in a social environment and they have inherited these attitudes and behaviors. And then there is respectab respectability politics, right? Which is essentially blaming the victim um, for conditions that exist, right? And leveraging that in order to advance one's own political um, uh, perspectives. And then there is acting out. Acting out can be summed up, you know, in one word, Donald Trump, <laughs> right? But essentially it is, what happens when uh, white folk start to get desperate. And we see it on the news daily in Congress. We see it in, you know, in, in all of the politics, politics. We're now seeing it in educational institutions and the like. Let's go on to the next slide as I try to wrap up here. So the contemporary milieu, right? Contemporary environment. Two expressions of white pathology are prevalent in the general population, right? Psych psychopathological individualism and sociopathological collectivism, right? Psychopathological individualism refers to the ingrained conceptions of individualism, right? Grow up in America, that's what you learn. It's part of the whole capitalistic uh, mindset. So even in its negative and self-destructive effects, it's seen as being virtuous, rugged individualism, right? Uh, so that's part of the psychopathology. In terms of the sociopathological collectivism, it refers to the acceptance of shared and self, shared self and other destructive behaviors and attitudes as normal or normative. So now it becomes normal within the context of society to do things that harm black people, right? And a, an example of that is, is, is the social justice system or policing in general. It, it should amaze you, all of you, that there is so little will when it comes to protecting the lives of black people from police and from police unions. 
it it really should. The idea that um, you know the 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 George Floyd bill would get shut down or other things that deal with common decency and basic humanity should signal us that the notion of white pathology is real. This is not just politics. This is far deeper than politics. This goes into ontological issues, the issues of being, the issues of existence. It goes into epistemological issues, the issues of knowing and how we know and what can be known. So, you know, psychopathological individual and sociopathological collectivism are the terms that we use to describe what's going on right now. So in each case, there's a lack of or an awareness of affect, meaning the impact of the pathologies, their actions, their behaviors and attitudes and emotions on non-white people, most specifically on black people. All right, so let's move on so we can conclude. So how do we respond? And I wanna conclude with that. So while it is impossible to address the impact of white pathology on the black mind without understanding white pathology, it is likely that a more effective redress will be the result of understanding the ideology, history, and expressions of white pathology, those things that I've just covered. In summary, four aspects of white pathology, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual, contribute to our understanding of white attitudes and behaviors, and in turn, provide some sense of how we can respond to them. Next slide. So when, uh, uh, okay, I don't think that's the next slide, is it? I think we've missed one. Okay, can we go back one or go forward one? Let's see. No, go forward. Go forward again. All right, my bad. Okay, so understanding and addressing hypervigilance. So uh, let's go through this again, and uh, hopefully it becomes clear. Hypervigilance is a general characterization of the state of black people in an oppressive social environment, right? It's rooted in trans, multi, inter, and intragenerational, intragenerational trauma. We only think of transgenerational trauma, but when you look at this thing very closely, it's it, there is trauma on multiple levels when it comes to black folk and why we behave the way we behave. So our hypervigilance is rooted in multi, inter, uh, trans, multi, inter, and intragenerational trauma. In short, it is passed across from one generation to the next. It affects all and is perpetuated in and between generations, right? So at its root is the idea of black inferiority and self-hatred. The inferiority and self-hatred are expressed consciously and unconsciously as a means of survival and exist on a spectrum ranging from mild to acute. That is to say that the way we have responded to our collective trauma can be seen in, um, in our hypervigilance, right? And that hypervigilance is manifested in this notion of black inferiority and uh, in its extreme self-hatred. It is perpetuated through, uh, uh, it is perpetuated systematically through our social structures. It is perpetuated um, institutionally through the dominant culture and it is reinforced through all forms of media. I have a collection of ads that I show to some of my classes of how this actually translates um, in terms of how uh, advertising is done and what it affects in, in the general population as it relates to reinforcing the idea of black inferiority and black self-hatred. Let's go to the next slide. All right, thank you very much. So here now is the, the idea of the spectrum of hypervigilance, right? So most of us are familiar, I think, with code switching. Code switching is the fact that you talk differently in your house and amongst your peers than you do in your work environment or in your school environment. That's part of hypervigilance. And that's, you know, that, that in itself can be mild, you know, but... Uh, I, I'm sorry, that in itself can be extreme, but for our purposes, right, let's let's say that it's mild, right? And it's at the 
at the end of the spectrum that is, you know, um, mild and not extreme. So code switching. Most black people, as a means of surviving in this society, in this environment, do code switching. And those were just a few examples. Silence is when something happens and we don't say anything. That's an example of hypervigilance. Accountability failure is when white folk do something or you're in a system or a structure where somebody should be held accountable, but you don't take that step to make them accountable, right? Hypervigilance, self-deprecation. That's when you put yourself down in order to make white folk feel more comfortable about themselves or to help them to feel less threatened. Self-negation is when you neglect yourself in order to perform on your job or wherever you may be to meet the approval of white folk. And these things are really not that uncommon, right? Um, inferiority concession. That's when you give in to the idea that white folk are superior to you. And again, I can't unpack all of this because of the limitations of time, but this is very common also, right? Racial uh, proxyism. This is when you allow white folk to use you to enforce their racism or their bias on other black people, right? Very common also. Um, then we have pseudo-spiritual sympathizing. This is when you essentially take what white people taught you about the Bible and about Christianity, and you apply it in the way that they taught you, not understanding that that application was never intended to be in your best interest, but always intended to be in their best interest. Examples of that would be like how um, servants obey your masters is used, or how turn the other cheek is used, or how what would Jesus do is used. It's this idea that black folk in the name of Christianity should take anything that white folk do and simply sing and pray their way out of it rather than doing like what white folk did when they said, give me liberty or give me death in the name of Jesus. I'm gonna take up arms for my limitation. But that's how Christianity has been used to subdue black people, right? We get the Jesus that turns the other cheek. They get the one that tells Peter to, to take, you know, uh, tells the disciples to put their swords by their sides, Spir uh, pseudo spiritual sympathizing. And then there's self hatred and hatred of black people. So you see that in people like Clarence Thomas and Ben Carson and others, Stacey, Stacey Dash, even though she tried to repent to get the card back to come back to the picnic. This is, this is at the extreme level of hypervigilance when black people so hate themselves that they will put down and subordinate other black people, um, you know, uh, in order to try to give themselves some sense of value and worth by being um, embraced by white people. So this represents the hypervigilance spectrum that I'm still working on. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So these items on the hypervigilance spectrum are a direct and indirect response to the trauma and pain of racism. That is why black people invoke those items because it's a, it's a way of coping. It's a way of surviving. This is what we do in order to make it here, right? And they share in common the perceived need to ease the anxiety or discomfort of white people or in the extreme to punish black people, right? So at the extreme end of hypervigilance, that's what you know, hypervigilant black people will do. They'll punish other black people. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're coming into strategies to counter hypervigilance. Number one, we need to understand white pathology as a comprehensive disorder, right? Biopsychosocial spiritual that affects the vast majority of white people, their intentions notwithstanding. Right? So we're not demonizing white people. We're simply saying, as we go to number two, that we need to understand the difference between socialized racism and overt slash intentional racism. All white people don't mean to be racist. All white people are not intentionally racist. But as a consequence of their socialization, most white people are racist, right? unintentionally so, unconsciously so. And uh, that, that's supported by data that comes from the implicit association test. Number three, 
Um, we need to understand the salience of the fifth commandment with reference to identity, sovereignty, self-respect, and self-determination. If we had taken that commandment seriously, then we would honor our heritage. We would be proud of who we are. We would understand it as a plus and not a minus. Can't take time to go into all of the theological ramifications. But after 430 years in Egypt, when they came out, this was the commandment that helped them to establish self-determinism, uh, self-determination, self-efficacy, self-identity. We could go on and on and on. Number four, we need to exercise accountability initiatives, which means we need to hold white folk accountable in every walk of life. When you go into the supermarket, when you go into the bank, where you work, where you play, everywhere. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about being disrespectful. I'm not talking about being, uh, um, you know, aggressive. I'm simply talking about finding ways to hold them accountability. You know, for me, it might be like, uh, like if I'm talking with a, a colleague, uh, excuse me, come again. I didn't get that. And they say, you know, something off, off color, like a microaggression. And then I might respond, you know, you probably didn't mean to say, but this is how it came out right? Talking about holding people accountability. Let's, uh, uh, to accountability. Let's go to the next slide. We need positive identity reinforcement through education that serves our interests as a people, including the deconstruction of false narratives and the affirmation of our collective interests. Dr. Amos Wilson has done a tremendous amount of work in this area. And one of the things that we don't often realize is that when we go into these educational institutions, wherever we go, they are not educating us for us. They're educating us to perpetuate their systems, their economy, their businesses, their enterprises, their organizations. I mean, look, I'm not knocking it. I've gone through most education that most people will have the opportunity to, and I'm very thankful for it. But we need to go in with a mindset of serving our community, serving our interests, right? Number six, active engagement with with and in institutions for the purpose of social and cultural transformation. Things will not change because we sit idly by and, and watch our people be abused and watch things happen that should not happen, right? So we have to be actively engaged wherever we are in helping these institutions or workplaces or whatever to transition. Unfortunately for some, this is not an us against them. We're not gonna turn the United States into a black republic. We are in this country with a lot of other folk, and we have to find ways that uh, enable us to uh, live with dignity and respect. And until we begin to do that, it's not going to happen. So this is not about overthrowing anyone or anything, but it is, it is about being actively engaged for the purpose of transformation. Number seven. Number seven, there's got to be moral, spiritual, and ethical development, including but not limited to reconstructing a healthy Christian identity predicated on biblical principles of justice, not predicated on what we have been told by white theologians about how to interpret the Bible. By using the gifted individuals that we have to look at the Bible again and to do that interpretation that is lacking because uh, certainly the people who have interpreted it traditionally have not had our experience, all right? And so this will aid in our moral, spiritual, and ethical development as a people, all right? And help us to have a healthy identity that's not constructed, you know, on the fallacies of the Eurocentric flaw. Number eight, we need to harvest a new generation that is free of the hypervigilance as a consequence of the aforementioned items, all the items I just mentioned. We've got to raise our children with a positive self-identity. We've got to raise our children with a healthy understanding of history and how history has been warped, how the narratives have been changed. We need to um, raise them, not with a hostile attitude, with an attitude that understands the nature of white pathology so that we don't see um, our existence in this world as being adversarial, but one that is perhaps more therapeutic than ad adversarial. You know, because the fact is that white pathology is in fact a disease that needs to be addressed. You know, it's no different in that respect from alcoholism, or drug addiction or any other type of disease. It's not fixed through uh, 
you know, politics and policy, which is where I depart from uh, Ibrahim Kendi, it is changed because we understand white pathology as a disease and because white people are willing to look at the disease and to have that disease treated. That's how it will be resolved. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. Uh, I couldn't share everything, but I hope what I have shared at least um, elicits a positive uh, conversation and further studies. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, we can't hear you. I was just going on. I was just saying this was such a wonderful presentation. I can see from the chat and the actual numbers of people watching going up that this was resonating with our audience. I know we only have about four minutes left. Um, you talked about uh, your book coming. Your book coming out. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book and how we can get access to more materials from you? Yeah, I'm still in the process of doing the research. New material just keeps coming. You know, every day Congress is doing something that contributes more to the examples of white pathology that I need. And then also I've had to develop facility in certain areas that I don't have a great deal of facility in, like genetics. Uh, one example would be we've, on, we've learned that um, no baby is born racist, right? And I've, mm. I've heard people say that. That's not altogether true. There is a biological and genetic component to racism, and I'm studying and exploring that now through uh, learning about epigenetics and behavioral genetics. So the research is deep. Another thing I've heard us say is that, um, you know, racism is white folks' problem. They need to fix it. That's not true. It's no more true than the alcoholic fixing his or her alcoholism or the drug addict fixing his or her alcohol dependency. No. Wow. We them. We're here to help them. <laughs> this is the research I'm doing. And the book hopefully will be done uh, uh, late fall, early spring. All right. Is there any way that our audience can be uh, get connected to you? Do you have a website or any? What's the way that people can uh, stay in contact with you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to not be too uh, too available because the research and the writing along with everything else I'm doing keeps me really, really busy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly if somebody wants to get in touch with me, um, they can reach me at, um, at um, jcrichton58, jcrichton58 at gmail.com. Well, we want to thank you so much for your passionate and wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, we, uh, this is not it. We are going to jump on Clubhouse. We actually have a Clubhouse group that's dedicated to the liberation movement. We just got access to that uh, this past week. It took about three months to do that, but we're excited to be on there. So we're going to have Dr. Crichton. He's going to jump on with us to have uh, a conversation with our audience and, and further the discussion about uh, about this idea of white pathology, and then you can uh, interact with them one on one via conversation. What we'll ask now, if we can run our commercial, and then we'll run right into the conclusion of our program. But we thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Crichton, for your presentation, and we want to encourage our audience to be with us next month at the end of the uh, end of next month, this last Saturday of next month, where we'll have where we'll have a all women's panel to talk about issues that are in a uh, black women's panel where they'll discuss about issues that are uniquely impacting black women. With that, have a wonderful rest of your, your Saturday and hopefully we'll jump on the clubhouse in the next few minutes. Thank you. I am the liberation movement. 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 My name is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. And I am the Executive Director and Founder of the Liberation Movement, which is a 501c3 organization that works with those who are liberated and seek to be liberated psychologically, 
socially and spiritually through educational initiatives. To continue to provide the high quality programming such as Saturday Soul, we need your support. Your consistent monthly investment in the movement will allow us to continue to expand on the excellent work that is already started, such as decolonizing the black mind curriculum that is already in development. So your gifts of any size uh, via Cash App, Venmo, or PayPal would be a blessing to the advancement of this ministry. Thank you in advance for supporting and joining the liberation movement. Please remember to join Sydney, me, and our special guest today on Clubhouse at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so we can dive deeper into today's topic. See you soon.